Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for, for coming along. I'm, I'm, I'll be as quick as possible so that I can listen to Donovan's talk about uh, Keybase, which is the major interest that I have in being here. All of this stuff, regrettably, I already know. Um, I say regrettably. Something you realize when you hit 60 is how long you've been around. You look back and there's all of this stuff that you think everybody knows, but they don't. You know, it's weird. I mean, when this thing kicked off, Future for Born, um, that was like 2011, really 1987. So I'll just try and bring you up to where we are by taking you back to the beginning, which is when everything in New Zealand was owned by the government. Uh, the railways were owned by the government, the broadcasting was owned by the government. The six o'clock news that was broadcast on the New Zealand Broadcasting Service in those plummy received English tones was approved by the Prime Minister's office. Signed off, now you can tell the people. Um, all of communications was owned by the government. The post office, the New Zealand post office and the postmaster general ran a bank. They ran the postal service, and as telecommunications became more uh, of a thing, they, they took over that as well. But in 1987, it all got broken into three pieces, New Zealand Post, <coughs> um, the, the bank, and telecom. And once they split it up into those three parts, they all got sold off. ANZ bought uh, Post Bank, um, New Zealand Post still survives, and... <coughs> And telecom was bought by two American companies and um, things really started to move away from uh, the government's control. Um, and a lot of changes happened in telecommunications, but not the changes that people wanted. And in 1995, some papers were put out by Treasury and by um, then the Ministry of Economic Development. And it was their feeling or claim that between 50 million and 250 million dollars a year was what it cost us to have a single vertically integrated telecommunications company uh, in New Zealand. They'd been deregulated and the regulation used to be such that at Victoria there's a little bridge that goes across Kelvin Parade. And Don Stokes, who some of you may know, ran a cable through that bridge and Telecom came along and said, take it down. They couldn't cross the road on their own bridge with telecommunications without violating the law. That's the kind of um, monopoly that you were dealing with, with even uh, before, um, before deregulation. Then they deregulated and sold it, sold it wrong, sold it in one piece. And of course, um, it was like four and a half billion. And in two or three years, the buyers had made that much profit and they could buy uh, that they'd, they'd made enough profit to pay for the asset, and it just continued to get worse from there. And the government did a, a lot of things. There was, uh, attempts at unbundling the local loop, because the vertically integrated monopoly is made of three parts, essentially. There's the copper, which is just a wire. And I call it passive, because when the power goes off, there's still just a wire. There's no service, but there's still just a wire. Then you put a couple of devices, one on either end, and suddenly you can signal between two points, and when you, uh, and then there's switching, which in the good old days with those NEAX switches on um, Zilog Z80 computers, um, that did all the voice work, so that you could dial, and you had that interoperability, and you could talk to people. So you had the copper, you had the active components, and then you had the switching. Well, the <coughs> the attempts were unbundling, which was unbundling loop. ULL, if you've um, heard that expression. And the idea there was that anybody could buy um, some copper and they could put what they wanted on the end of it and they could build services that would then compete with telecom. As you can imagine, not very popular. <clears throat> not with telecom. In fact, this had happened in Hamilton. A couple of entrepreneurial types had found out that they could buy DSL equipment and dry pairs, lease dry pairs from telecom their own equipment on either end and suddenly give you a, you know, a high-speed data service, a DSL data service, a digital subscriber line that was infinitely cheaper than the metropolitan 
data distribution services that Telecom was offering at the time. So there were all these attempts to engender more competition. They all rather failed. Um, and it's really hard to see how they all did. Cellular telephony came along. Cellular telephony and the AMP system was designed to have two operators, a landline operator and a wireless operator. Who knows why, but telecom got to buy all the spectrum and AMPs. Uh, and so you had no intramodal competition for cellular. If you wanted to work with a different cellular supplier, you needed a different phone. And this intramodal competition is very well known in transportation and physical transport. Roads, rail, trucks, aircraft, ships, bicycles, pedestrians. They're all forms of transport and they all compete on a piece of passive infrastructure that's been around for a few centuries, that well-known open road. Um, and the open road's a pretty simple thing. It's been carrying all of our stuff since the, um, since the Romans, perhaps even before. Um, but you can put all this new stuff on that old passive infrastructure and it pretty much works. Though, uh, as demand increases and congestion occurs, we get wondrous things like the uh, divergent diamond interchanges and all kinds of weirdness to, to manage it. But it's still just a piece of passive infrastructure. So there was this struggle between telecom and the government for a number of years. And despite the ideological beliefs about the market, it was pretty clear that telecom's uh, dominance was such that it wasn't going to get sorted simply. And finally, uh, the government decided that what they needed to do in order to advance both competition and the kinds of technologies that were available in New Zealand was that they would finally have to take responsibility for the passive infrastructure the way they do for the road, the way they have done in the past for uh, electricity lines. They were going to have to take responsibility. They were going to have to pay for it. But because they didn't have that much money, they created a framework that was going to fund the laying of fibre, and that was the Ultrafast Broadband Initiative, UFB. But it was designed to deal with the problem that they had with telecom squatting on the passive infrastructure and doing everything in their power, every legal trick, every, every kind of lobbying that they could to retain it. And that's what we incent profit-driven organisations to do. No. Uh, yeah. Institutions um, always act to meet the problem that they were set up to solve. Yes. Oh dear. Oh dear. Well, I'll go home now because if that's the case, we're in, we're in deep doo doo. Because, as you're no doubt aware, in the UFB, the government set up the Crown Fibre Holdings, who were to manage this. Uh, uh, contractual process with various organisations to build the fibre. And the very first thing that I saw Crown Fibre Holdings doing was saying, and these are the services that you will run on the fibre, and these are the speeds that you will offer, and these will be the prices that you charge. So essentially what you'd gone from was a vertically integrated telecom into a kind of distributed model where Crown Fibre Holdings was now telecom head office and setting national standards for everything. And the LFCs, who were the local fibre companies, and we'll come to that, um, were being directed in a way that was very like the old model. And perhaps Shirky's... The, the Shirky I use from Clay Shirky is Clay Shirky points out that we very often criticise new things like Bitcoin while ignoring the problems of our existing solutions like central banking. But, um, no, I'll take that theory, uh, and you can tell me whether it's happening. So, we're out to solve the problem of a single operator for a critical passive infrastructure by creating a new passive infrastructure. And face it, when you move into a home, you don't say, oh, will I get the electricity put on? You don't generally ask a question, you might now, but you didn't used to, about whether you're going to have telephony. 
but apparently fiber is still in that introductory phase where apparently there's a question about having it or not. And while it's not universal, it's not going to be as powerful as it could be if it were. Because if it were universal, if everywhere a human being was or had been for a maximum of 15 minutes, the kinds of services, the kind of market that would represent would be enormous. Because we're going to, as we run out of energy, which seems to be the happening, the things that you can do with high-speed telecommunications in terms of health, education, monitoring, minimization of consumption, all kinds of activities that could happen if fiber was universal. So anyway, this is a really good idea, I think, this fiber. It's the fourth home connection after water, after electricity, after the driveway, <laughs> after the phone, you get fiber, and it's just there. And it meters your power, does the kinds of things that um, Fore Oro were talking about last meeting of this group. So it's a, it's a really desirable thing. And how did they do it? Well, firstly, they divided the country into 30 areas of interest. Why? To make them small so they wouldn't get big and take the government to court. As it happened, in the uh, closing moments of the negotiations, because there was an invitation to participate, suddenly Telecom got a little bit nervous, as you do, and suddenly they wanted to take part in this. So the idea was you get local fibre companies. They were going to do fibre. They would lay out fibre infrastructure. It would go to the home. They'd do it in, as it turned out, four areas. <coughs> There's Enable. I think I've called them the Big Bad Wolf, which is Chorus, of course, and then the Three Little Pigs, which are Enable, North Power, and Ultrafast Fibre. They were going to lay the fibre. Over the top of this parochial, provincial, local knowledge, all the kinds of things that we'd exploited in the power line um, deployment, you would put a, a national lighter upper, preferably two. And they would simply light up the glass that was there. So as soon as somebody built a piece of glass or fibre to a home, there would immediately be two choices of bit streams available and in terms of the switching, the retail, the layer three, currently there are 140 uh, ISPs, RSPs registered to, uh, to sell choruses fibre because although it's LFCs, there's one and then there's three, 70%, 30%. And it's, it's a little bit difficult for the regulation to treat them all the same. I would bugger them, but you know, there's a few concessions made here and there. For the infant businesses, that's the lines companies that have taken this up, or new entrants into, uh, into passive infrastructure. And then there's the incumbent with all the baggage that um, their, their situation has left them and us with. So how are we doing? We've got three layers, passive, active, retail. We've got regional fibre companies, a layer of national lighting up so that wherever the glass appears, boom, you can get a choice of 140 RSPs, ISPs if you will. This is looking really good. Unfortunately, there were, and, and as you can see on the screen, but it's probably impossible to read by design. Open access guiding principles. Everything about the, uh, the <coughs> UFB was about separating, completing the unbundling that hadn't been possible because of the incumbent determination to do it and the fact. So they were building a Greenfields passive infrastructure. They had the perfect first time opportunity to make sure that the people who laid the roads didn't build all the trucking firms. And yet that's not what happened. What happened was there were a lot of arguments. And if you if, and consider what you see there on 13.4, impact of current telecommunications operations. This is the clause that split Spark 
and chorus asunder from telecom. So this, the, the requirements in here were strong enough to split telecom into two, and I suspect part of the reason that happened was that telecom knew it was inevitable, and this was a way to get $929 million to do something that they would have had to do anyway. Um, but it was strong enough to split the two. Unfortunately, what then happened was, there's a whole lot of comment there from Stephen Joyce, mandatory in the deed that all local fibre companies build their network equivalents of input ready for unbundling at layer one in 2020. It will ensure that the new fibre network is being built for full open access and competition after the initial build stage. And you're saying, after the initial build stage? What happened was, <clears throat> Concerns about the complexity and uncertainty of this new infrastructure meant that unbundling during the deployment phase was considered too complicated. And there was also the issue that, you know, fibre, internet, could be a fad, could go to zero, just like Bitcoin. Um, but, uh, and there were these infant businesses, these are actually lines companies in most cases that have been around for centuries. Um, so they said, no, you don't have to, you don't have to split now. Give us, some, give us some agreements, and there are open access undertakings that are registered for each of the LFCs that I don't think have been used by anyone because they're rather onerous. Um, and we'll, we'll just, we'll open it all up come 2020. How about that? Well, of course, everything went... Um, I would say everything went, unsurprisingly, very, very well. Progress was ahead of schedule. Uh, the build was 70% towards 85% of the population having broadband. Those other 15%, I don't know. They're the people who don't get hospitals or roads or electricity or education because, you know, you can split the citizenry into the 85% that makes profit for the LFCs a.k.a. Chorus, and then there's the 15% who can get some kind of NBN from Australia, wireless kludge made of Chorus and Voda and Spark and Uncle Tom Cobley and all. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to change that. Um, we were doing good, and Australia was doing shit. And so we just rested on our laurels, and as good as we are doing... We don't really know how good it could be if the open access undertakings had been enforced. Well, unfortunately, that honeymoon success, the false sense of security, old habits die hard. It's difficult for people to believe that you can just do the passive infrastructure. I mean, electricity line companies have just been doing the passive infrastructure. Somebody else generates it. They deliver it. They make a living. Pretty good one. In fact, they make enough... Delta makes enough money to uh, subvent tax. Um, and what seems to have happened is that the structural separation of telecom into Spark and Chorus hasn't been regarded as an amputation, that these two things will separate, separate and work differently. It's just we got rid of Spark and now Chorus and Enable and the LFCs can now grow to be regional, vertically integrated telcos, which makes life... But that's okay. That's okay because it's all wholesale. You see, what we didn't understand was all we had to do to fix the problem with telecom was to just make, prevent them from retailing. We just put a whole, that's irony. It's actually sarcasm. It's all I've got. Um, but the thing is, <laughs> they've got this fig leaf of open access wholesale. Doesn't sound right to me either. So, what are we going to do? Well, the telecommunications new regulatory framework amendment bill 2018 has just gone through the select committee process and it is going to continue this process of abandoning open access. What they've said is, it's all going so well. It's all so good. Look at Australia. Australia wishes they were us. Maybe, maybe this open access thing is just an unnecessary complication and it might 
destabilize what's going on. Um, that's what they're saying. They're also looking in the bill at removing the barriers to upstream activities by the LFCs. At the moment, they control the fibre. They control the bit streams in the fibre. And what they want to do, as everybody does who's in that position, is that they want to use their position to enter uh, DNS services, content, CDNs, all of that, maybe even encryption and key management and the whole, the whole um, nine yards, essentially. And once upon a time, that was probably possible. It was possible to have a singly, single vertically integrated organisation delivering dial tone. But now we're talking about a technology and a passive infrastructure which is so complex and so diverse. Is anybody here with Spark? Do you get your free light box from Spark? Do you get your Sky from Vodafone? I mean, it's weird. Why? I don't buy my furniture from a carrier. I get it delivered by a carrier and I go to a shop to buy furniture. And yet, what they're doing at the moment is saying, well, you know, we're Spark. We want to be your go-to entertainment centre. And, of course, the recent news, Spark's got the Rugby World Cup 2019, the streaming coverage in conjunction with TVNZ. So they are really turning into a television station. Now, look, I'm sorry, I do tend to wander. Is there some area of confusion that I could address in what little time remains to me about where we are? Or do you want to know what's next? I'd like to hear from a woman. Karen? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but you're it. <laughs> okay, okay. No, I don't want to embarrass anybody. It was just, you know... Thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> I think it's, I think, I think old habits die hard. I think for, when they separated telecom, they did it like this. They took, like an apple, right? And they cored it. And they took Spark out, and it's a vertically integrated model. It's got its own fiber. It's got its own cell towers and cell services, and they put a, the Gen I's and all the computer worlds on top of it so that they were a full service. I mean, they, they called it. The remainder of the Apple, the outer bit, that's the access network, that went to Chorus. That is what Chorus is. They are the access network. They got half of the inter-exchange fibre, but they were basically a layer where telecom is this vertical. And now, I think what Chorus is planning is... Let's get through this phase with the bill. And when we've got certainty, which they pretty much have, that none of the requirements that they signed up for will ever be enforced. Because in the, in the initial consultation, the thing was, layer one, let's just talk about this bill, and I think it'll sort of help. Part four of the Commerce Act has things in it like gas pipelines, electricity lines, international airport runways, and there's one other that eludes me because I'm panicking, but they're all passive infrastructures. They're all infrastructures if their owners and operators were allowed to exert exclusive rights over them would damage the efficiency of the airport of the electricity lines. If the lines company only carried the electricity that it wanted to, that gave it the biggest price, then all of us would suffer. So you put something in part four, passive infrastructure, electricity lines, gas pipelines, the fourth one will come to me, um, international runways, so that you can wedge them open with regulated pricing so that competitors can enter and compete on that runway. Different airlines landing. Different generators making electricity. 
it's, it's, it's a thing for com competition at the active layer. And so when they said, oh, we're going to use the uh, building block model and utilities, and we're going to put them in part four, I was overjoyed because this meant they would make dark fiber available, as CityLink has in Wellington for as long as I can remember. Um, and even though they set up GPON, which is a kind of a bus structured network, there are different frequencies within the GPON network which could be operated by different people. And there is off the shelf equipment from Nokia that does this. So you can have a wholesale network operator doing just fiber, nothing else. No distraction, no, you know, 85% of the population's covered. That's going to maximize our return from the active layer. You 15% will send you a, hey, you can have 5G in 2025 or some other era. Um, so, so they're putting it in part four. It should open it up. You don't put something in part four of the Commerce Act so you can have wholesale. That's, that's ludicrous. Um, so I, it, it, it was a bit of a disappointment. So does everybody want yes? Because what they've got, the LFCs, is they've got passive, they've got active, and they're that far from being a retail service provider. There's 140 of them cutting margins left, right, and centre, while things like Chorus and the LFCs have a linear price increase based on CPI until 2025, I think, <coughs> or at least 2020. So yes, they want to be vertically integrated because it makes them masters of their own destiny, fiefdoms if you like. Um, what it does to the RSPs, I'm not really sure because they're now going to have to deal with four different organisations pushing their own parochial solutions and it's going to make the coordination problem a lot more difficult. And the, th the thing is, if what you do with a, something in part four is you, there's a, it's a whole lot of complication, I don't understand, but it's like this. You get a regulated asset base and you get a return on it. Now, if fiber was the asset base and you had averaged prices, so it was the same everywhere, the only way you could make more money as an LFC would be to lay more fiber. And therefore, you would lay fiber. You would lay fiber everywhere. And everywhere you laid fiber, the lighter uppers, hopefully at least two, would deliver a bit stream or two. And wherever there was a bit stream, there would be 140 retail service providers. Now, your two bit stream people are going to fight like dogs and that's going to carve their margin to nothing. You're going to get a regulated return at the passive layer, and RSPs, I don't know what they're going to do. If you look at Stuff Fiber or Big Pipe or any of these people, they've pretty much, I, I'm hoping that all of the um, software-defined networking in New Zealand is going to be running those things. So there's six, six people and a pager. So their costs are nothing. They don't have to build it, they just light it up and collect the money. But that model isn't going to happen because, and this is, <laughs> in the initial consultation, the idea was, yeah, we'll go and have a look at that, uh, what, yeah. So layer one can't be an anchor product. A, rail, a runway is an anchor product, access to the, uh, to the electricity network or the gas pipeline is an anchor product. It's regulated in terms of price and quality, it delivers a return to the operator which is considered to be reasonable given the enormously low risk. Um, it gives us a reasonable return. And, um, the anchor product in the bill is basic broadband. We haven't defined a basic broadband yet, but given that you can get a gig for $99 from Slingshot, I mean, how more basic can it get? and a basic telephony service. And since basic telephony service is a $5 feature on that $99 gigabit, I don't know how that anchors anything. And in the final insult 
to your intelligence with respect to part four and the building block model of utility regulation that only applies to chorus. So you, this, is, this is what is happening. Um, I don't know if it's going to change, but um, that whole regulated asset base and lim limited uh, return. Because what will happen is, is you know, we're quite proud of the fact we're in NASB and covering 85% of the population. But it won't go any further because the amount of money that Chorus and the LFCs can make is mostly, they would see, in the lighting up, not in the glass. And there are economists, economists who would support my view. Benoit Felton is one of them. But, okay, so that's your question, I hope. Any more questions? I don't know. I don't think it can be fixed. I think somewhere between open access being a key fundamental principle of the UFB and where we are today, eight years later, with enormous success and absolute certainty that if you control the fibre and you're the only one who can get into that fibre and light it up, I don't think any of our infant businesses or... Um, the uncertainty about fibre has completely gone away. Uptake was supposed to be 25, it's 38. Is it a matter of stacking the executives or lobbying? Well, that could help. But it, what, what I find, well, you know, I used to be with Internet NZ. They're comfortable with this. Tuans is comfortable with this. All of the people who, back in the day, were banging on, uh, banging on the doors of... Paul Swain, um, David Cunliffe, Stephen Joyce, Amy Adams, this whole 10 or 20 years of trying to unbundle the local loop, that saying, OK, we can't. Let's lay a new fi fibre infrastructure. And, oh, it's too complicated. Oh, infant businesses. Oh, we'll wait until 2020. Oh, and now, in the consultation they sent out, it was, we will make an anchor product, passive... Fibre can be an anchor product after an investigation which cannot commence until 2023 and after 65% uptake of the UFB. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very strange thing to me that, you know, we'll spend one and a half billion to dig a hole in Auckland so people can burn petrol in it, and yet... The one and a half billion that they spent on the UFB wasn't enough and they knew it, so they, ran, they churned it three times, plus whatever contribution the actual LFCs made themselves. But of course, with the uptake being so much higher, you've seen things like the joint venture that was set up by Crown Fibre Holdings and North Power was it intended to be bought out in 2020. It's gone. Because I think North Power realised they were making so much money out of this but they didn't want to share it with um, didn't want to share it with Crown Fibre Holdings anymore, so they just took it back. So I'm sorry. Yeah, there's, I, I do this a lot. Tell people about things. I don't have a solution for it, but I, I and I just thought it was worth telling some people because I don't know who you know. I don't know what buttons you can push or levers you can pull, but um, maybe there's a possibility that the problem is that. In eight years, North Power has already tested 10 gig symmetric on their GPON. If you don't get them out of there, they're going to be as ensconced in the fibre that we paid to build as telecom was in the copper that we paid to build. And our answer to that problem will be nugatory. It won't happen. But that's OK, because like I've got 200 down. And 20 up for 99 bucks a week, a month. Um, maybe it is enough. It just doesn't seem to me to be likely that that will work forever. Sir? Um, if, you, if this was working with the anchor product, if I understand that right, yep. like the basic thing of fiber. Lambdas or dark fiber, yep.
Well, the thing about passive infrastructure is, is that, yes, the, the, there isn't a lot to make better, right? The road is the road. We put a dotted line down the middle, we put some macadam on it, we, you know, we created all of motorways and stuff, but it's still just a road. And where does the money come from? Well, there is, it, you can make provision in the RAB and the, the rate of return so that there is. All you will have to do, though, is as you watch power poles fall over in Dunedin and various other places around the world, you'll have, I would make this, the quality of and the maintenance, you know, like an ISO 9000 thing, you don't get paid unless you're maintaining it. Because I think we've seen enough sales of passive infrastructures. We did railways twice. We sold it twice. I mean, how... Um, and what happens? Somebody comes in, they run it for three years, they run it down, they don't even live here, they fuck off back to Australia, their pockets are full of our money, and what have we got? Rags. Um, you know, the, the, the powers went out and the whole train system in Wellington vanished. <laughs> I mean, Auckland. Honestly. Category 2 storm. People still haven't got their power back. We're just not paying attention to the stuff that actually matters, which is the foundations of it. We're all playing on the field. I mean, but nobody's maintaining the field, and we've put it in the hands of organisations who have a history of doing stuff that eventually, oh, this isn't, this isn't working for us anymore. Glass has been around 25, 30. I mean, it's been around as long as City Link. That's about 20. But it was there before yeah, then. Still, uh, most of the most of the advances in 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 telecommunications are either are at the ends. Yep. It's like it's the handset and the access point. It's you know for free space. For copper, it was the same. I mean, that's the same copper that was carrying phone calls in 1945. Yep. It's now got DSL on it and it's doing so much better than it was, and we've pumped it just you know, 300 board, 1,200, 24, 48, 56. I mean, the copper didn't change a bit. So there's no vast need to upgrade the copper. You do need to do it. Wellington's sitting here with our 60-year-old pipes falling apart. Um, again, some kind of you know, maintenance needs to be done, no question, but you don't need to make a big profit to do that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. But what, what I would say for fibre is it is foreseeable future proof. Because I've got a letter, well, I did get a letter in 19-something, 70-something, from Richard Naylor, at CityLink saying that the fibre he was going to install would carry up to a terabit. And I don't think any fibre is doing a terabit yet, but it's, it's, you know, in CityLink's network, but it could. I mean, it's such a giant over spec. Grant, you will stop me when time's up, won't you? Yes, well, we can do that any time now. Yes, good. <laughs> okay. I'm, yeah, the, I didn't realise Oh, hell yes. Good grief. I mean, the second greatest gift God can give you is to love the sound of your own voice. The greatest gift is to find somebody to listen to it. And you've, you've done marvellously well here tonight. So